On this episode, we are talking about the film before the Snyder Cut. We're going back to World War I to talk about 2017's landmark film, Wonder Woman. We'll explain why this film is groundbreaking for the comic book movie genre, Diana's comic roots, the value of human life, PTSD, and much more. I'm Captain Nostalgia, and this is the Victims and Villains Podcast, a podcast extension of the nonprofit that educates and engages individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. Grab your God Killer and your Shield because the show starts right now. It is time for the penultimate film. Before we reach the Snyder Cut, we are talking about. 2017's Wonder Woman. Really surprised we haven't actually covered this one yet. I'm joined by Brandon Rift Daddy Miller. What's up? I'm back for more. So excited to have you back, man. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm joined by a guest making her victim's debut. Honestly, whoop surprised whoop. that uh, we haven't gotten her uh, before yeah, now. Rude. Uh, her husband's been on the show plenty of times. He's our resident Superman guy. He did uh, the Demons and Mental Health episodes with us last year. Uh, she is a teacher, a mental health advocate, and a Wonder Woman super fan. It's Kate Webster. Oh, my girl. I love her. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> uh, well, all right. Let's, uh, I, I guess, kind of like, I, w- I want to ask you. Um, okay. Kind of being the woman in this conversation. Oh, thank you kindly. Well, hold on. Let me, let me back up. That did not come out right. What is it about Wonder Woman that you find so inspiring or compelling? Oh, man. What a question. Um, man. Okay. So, obviously, there's a lot of male superheroes out there. Um. And I, wh- I feel like Wonder Woman is totally the answer to that. Um, I have loved her since childhood and just thought she was the absolute coolest. Um, being, <laughs> in a lot of ways, almost the opposite of what I am, at least physically, <laughs> being, you know, this very tall, strong woman, black hair, blue eyes. And here I am, this tiny little five foot one, red hair, well, blue eyes, but still (laughs) Um, just finding that to be, I don't know, just super cool to be able to see something like that and and being able to keep up with the boys. Um, Because growing up, I was definitely that tomboy and loved being able to keep up with the boys and, you know running around getting dirty and scraping up my knees and climbing trees and, you know, jumping fences and playing baseball. And (laughs) I love that kind of stuff. And uh, I definitely think Wonder Woman is, I don't know, just kind of the epitome of all of that. Just to kind of give you a, the listeners and and also Brandon, because, you know, we're doing this over Skype, uh, a little bit of context for like, what Kate looks like. <laughs> it's uh if you guys have ever seen the movie Brave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brave is is basically uh Mirda, is that her name? M- yeah, Mirda. Yeah, Mirda is basically Kate incarnate. <laughs> That's 100% accurate. <laughs> uh, for me, I think the Wonder Woman was a character that I kind of had this like really shallow look on comics. Like I was like, it's yeah. a, it's a man's game. Yeah. Like I just want to read Batman. And like, that was kind of my exclusive and uh, introduction to comics. And then Watchmen forever changed that where like you have a character like the Silk Spectra who is like, it's like really strong, but really flawed and like complex character that I was like, I kind of want to get to know other female characters. And one of them was my introduction into those characters. And I picked up the George Perez run of her after Crisis on Infinite Earths and dear God, it, it forever changed my epitome on like my, my view on like women in comics. And like now I, I would actually say that I prefer females in comics than yeah. I do uh, males because they're, they're so much more interesting, but they're so much more inspiring. I feel like because they have so much more, 
that you know the characters feel like they have to prove mm-hmm. um and uh we're gonna definitely talk about a lot of comic influences today <laughs> uh brandon what about you though man so i i've actually always been super high on women in comics like growing up i didn't read a lot but i watched a lot of the animated series and i was a huge fan of the x-men animated series and i was a huge fan of rogue and uh, shadow cat from x-men evolution so like i i kinda, I think i got into comic books more because i i, I like the women characters more than i did the the men um so what but wonder woman was one that i was a huge fan of up until the last couple of years when the movie came out I, it made me more interested in wonder woman than i already was and i read the the ran the run that you talked about george Perez's run and um that actually changed my outlook on wonder woman now i have like three pair of wonder woman socks so <laughs> <laughs> just the socks <laughs> yeah, socks um but but yeah like for me like some of, some of the best stories i've read have either been like a run that's based on a female superhero or has one evolved like right now i'm reading um daredevil guardian devil by kevin smith and like one of the main things of it is karen page and it's like i'm more interested in karen page's arc in this than i am matt murdoch's art and i feel like you can't have a comic book if it was just like heavily based on like the male superhero i just fucking wouldn't be as interesting as if it was based on just a female or both you know what i'm saying like i don't know i feel like you have to have that but yeah i, I i've been like super big on female characters in comics for all my life that I've been into this stuff because like that's like I said earlier that's what attracted me the most was being a huge fan of Rogue and Shadowcat as a as a kid yeah I I really really uh love some of the X-Men and some of what Marvel offers as far as uh women in comics as well and this this particularly I mean this is a groundbreaking film like we don't really consider Wonder Woman to be this like toward a force of like cinema but when you think about it you know we are now in a cinematic landscape where you know superheroes are kind of like a cornerstone foundation for the world's you know take intake of of pop culture and and media for for most part you know the avengers endgame right now holds the number one spot uh the highest grossing movie ever made for like 2.7 billion dollars and up until wonder woman like this was a this was a man's game yeah like wonder woman and patty jenkins gail gadot like they forever changed the game on this and it 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 wasn't just like oh, oh hey this is a female superhero this is actually a legitimately great movie on top of being a compelling like superhero movie that challenges the the archetypes of of what we think a comic book movie can be oh yeah i i definitely i i fully agree with that and i love that um you can see how real she is in the movie that you genuinely see her struggles of that those internal struggles of um, you know, this is what I've been taught my whole life. This is what I see that's going on. Um, and I don't know. I just think about myself as a female, my, my other, you know, female friends and, and <laughs> especially the struggles of the world today. I mean, and it's, it's very relatable. It's not something that's so far fetched. You're like, well, I'll never be a ninja like Batman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll never be an alien like Superman. But, you know, I mean, obviously, I'll never be an Amazon. That's fine. <laughs> but but I, I just find her to be very real and very relatable. Um, that, you know, when she does come to the real world, that, you know, she can very easily interact with people. And it's not super weird. <laughs> Yeah, you're not trying to like find <laughs> that like uh, I need to disguise myself because everyone's gonna <laughs> yes, know that it, the, the I'm Superman. <laughs> uh, I, I really enjoy like that 
take of this and and this movie too also was like a breath of fresh air for the dc eu you know we've been talking Ooh, we all needed it too <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've all been talking about over the last few episodes you know man of steel was like very diversive upon release like bvs was very diversive upon release uh suicide squad was mostly negatively received and then you have wonder woman right before justice league and it was like I think it holds like a, a little over at ninety percent right now in Rotten Tomatoes. Like it was just such a breath of fresh air, not only for superhero movies but the DC movies as well. Well, they needed it. <laughs> they needed it real bad. Hey, you are welcome to your opinion, <laughs> uh, Brandon. Did, did you want to uh, jump in on anything? Yeah. So, like what um, Kate was saying about Wonder Woman and her influence, like she she gave. Well, well, I say girls but anybody a a really good like example to look at to 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 go through like the world and kind of like i don't know what i'm I'm looking for here like how she like was taught all these ideals and stuff and then she came to to our world and kind of like blended in with all that and had to like learn how to like blend in and like i guess survive in a different like situation than she was in so it's like she gave like people like, like women an example and someone to look up to for that and i think that like the realism of gal Gadot's, um character really stood out the most to me because it, it it gave like it finally gave us like that female lead that, that the world needed like a fresh breath there the world needed in the dcu for sure yeah i yeah oh yeah she she also wasn't that like, dare I say it, overpowering feminist. <laughs> That's like, women must rule the world. Like it's she was very much a team player in everything as oh, well, yeah. and knew when it was her time to lead, and knew when it was her time to follow, and and being able to, you know, help um, edify the team as a whole. Um, because I, I love those, even those sweet little moments throughout the movie, too, where she is encouraging the other guys. Like, no, you got this. You, you're okay to do this. Um, which I think is, is, is sweet because, I mean, I know that's also very much me <laughs> and my character as well, that I, I enjoy being able to edify people. And um, so I think that is, that's pretty important to you, being able to see that she's a, a, an actual team player and not just yeah. here to, to dominate the boys. Oh yeah, like, she's a prime. <laughs> she's a prime example of coexisting in like, I guess like equality in a way. Like every everybody's equal to her, you know. Like yeah, it wasn't it was one over the other. Like she she's a prime example of that. I think in that movie, and it wasn't always this way though. This uh, this <laughs> film had a long road to the to the silver screen. It sought many different directors, many yeah. different writers, and. All of them were male, and it, it's always yeah. harder for you know we. You go back and you look at like super or sorry, Wonder Woman was created by William Marston, um, who also like had like influence on like developing like, the lie detector test and, um, but like he was notoriously like he over sexualized Wonder Woman. Yeah. Uh, just just a little bit. Um, yeah, because realistically, if you are a warrior, you ain't gonna wear that. Yeah, exactly. You ain't gonna wear that. No. Um, <laughs> and, and so like, it's it's interesting to like go back and like look at the history of like yeah. how this uh film was in like development for so long. Where I think like names that were like being tossed, like Sandra Bullock, was like considered in like the late nineties, which just baffles my mind (laughs) um to think about a world like that but uh, like a lot of them we were talking about this when we watched the movie uh kate was uh the scene where steve she she gets to london and steve's like oh you can't wear that like you're not wearing anything like cover (laughs) up and uh, a lot of like the earlier versions of this like really kind of made her like a prostitute or like a stripper and they just like try to like make her as like sexy as like possible, and it's like that's not what this character needs. Like yeah. that's not who this character is. And I think that sometimes you know Wonder Woman, the reason why it took so long was because I, I think a lot of you know cinema 
sought women in that way. And, you know, Wonder Woman now is in this, like, being released in this post-Me Too movement world. And it just, it was perfect timing. And, And having a director like Patty Jenkins really come in and understand the character and the lore and... I think it it makes it that much more effective as a film. Yeah, I I agree with that as well because you you do look at the history of comic books and you see these like super over sexualized, not realistic proportional women that you're like, wait a second, yeah. that's not even like that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Nor if I'm running through you know a battlefield or whatever, I'm I'm not going to be wearing a bathing suit doing that. <laughs> Um, not, I'm not going, I'm not going to do that. That's just, that's, that's not realistic for me. <laughs> yeah. Also, here's a fun fact about the early, uh, Wonder Woman comics. If you take them to get CD, CGC graded, uh, and th- the early, like Wonder Woman, I want to say like first, like 10 years had a heavy, um, like bondage S and M BDSM uh, influence to it. And if you actually like have a cover where Wonder Woman is tied up, like they'll actually put in parentheses, like Wonder Woman number bondage edition. It, it's super weird. And there, there is one scene in particular where they do nod to that original uh, in the, in the movie, in the final climax that I was kind of like this time around, I was like, man, I was like, they, they, they can't let that go, can they? It's forever, <laughs> I guess, glued to the character. <laughs> uh, everybody has a weird history. <laughs> to be fair, so. <laughs> so I never actually called on to that whole bondage thing with Wonder Woman. That's the first time I ever heard that before. Um, that's, that's funny. I, I have never heard that until just now. They uh, back in two thousand, I, I, DC had released like this like biographical history of the character <clears throat> and the creator, and I have it, and it's a fascinating book. And I came away from it, and I was like, man, I feel so disgusted now that I've liked this character for so long, and I, I feel like I can't like there are certain parts in Wonder Woman's history where like I can't read her. Yeah. Um. And like, it's definitely like those early like uh, Malton comics, but it's also the uh like the weird '60s era where like she was still like <laughs> strong, but she was a housewife. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, there's definitely been so much evolution to her because it's all been based on you know what was popular of the time, and and um, you know, you think about things like that and. <laughs> Oh, Wait, man. was 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 bondage popular in the sixties? <laughs> there were a lot of weird things happening in the nineteen sixties. <laughs> man, it was, the, it was the sexual rev- revolution, you know, yes. free love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, like it's hard for me to read a lot of things before Crisis of Infinite Earths. Honestly, like I, I've tried reading other like uh, character stuff like pre Crisis. It's just so hard for me to get interested in it. Like I don't know. Like, things definitely got better, I think, after Crisis, and that's, it, it will for both, Marvel and DC both, I think it got better, <laughs> but, I don't know, that's just me, I guess. Well, I, I guess, like, let's, let's change gears here, and, uh, let's, let's address the elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, with the, with Crisis, you were kind of given this, like, relaunch universe of DC, and with that, you have the aforementioned Perez run on Wonder Woman that really kind of reinvented who that character was and really set Ares up to be like her big bad. Yeah. Uh, that would like just follow her from like 1985 and 1986 when those runs started up until present day. And uh, this movie kind of does a real disservice to the character of Ares. And uh, I think, you know, Let's just get the negative out of the way. <laughs> go for it. Uh, go for it. <laughs> David Thwaites is a fantastic actor. He was so good in, uh, I'm thinking of ending things last year. And of course, fans know him from as Professor Lupin from the Harry Potter films. But I don't know. Like, he just kind of seems like the wrong choice. And I, we were talking about this when we yeah, were watching it. Yeah. 
he kind of seems like the wrong choice but like the right choice at the same time like yeah. it, it's it's a weird dynamic that they present with his character yeah. yeah what i was saying during the film was that um in some ways he is that perfect fit because he looks like the sweet precious you know innocent man but that is part of war is deception and that he yeah. is deceiving everyone um which is how he was so easily able to influence everybody around him because they saw him as, you know, this sweet, innocent, oh, he can't do any harm, so of course I can listen to him. I can trust what he has to say. Um, and I think that is very powerful in war, is that that deception and that type of influence. Um, but I kind of agree that when he was in his form, <laughs> he still looked like that cute little kitten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, oh. it, it's a really weird dynamic and i know brandon you and me were texting about it this morning like uh, every time i watch this movie like i'm like man i'm like i'm so enthralled and like inspired yeah. by the character and we'll talk about those inspirations and those mental health themes as we proceed but like you get to that final climactic battle between <laughs> yeah. her and aries and it's just like it's like this like cute little kitten just like trying to like <laughs> think that he's like this like big bad alley cat and it's like no yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you look at him and you're like there's no way this guy's beating wonder woman that, that, that's not happening <laughs> that's that's that, that's kind of what he uh, came off for me i'm like this guy really but i don't know i, I love the, the actor though i i feel like if we had they like did just kind of taken his like character design and like not had those kind eyes like maybe just like had like the red eyes like we've we've seen in some of the comics like i don't think that i would have had that big of a problem with it but the fact that you have a guy that is very clearly like this like gentle soul especially when he spends the entire movie (laughs) with a cane like it's like he very much is like like you were saying kate like he's the least likely guy And they use the the art of like war and like deception very powerfully in, in yeah in that respect, but it's also very weird to like see him in his final form where yeah. I don't even know like even like during like the flashbacks like where he's like showcasing like how he ended up like where he is like I'm like no I can't I can't <laughs> he's he's so small he's so so, so small <laughs> he's just a proper little British man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know honestly who i would have replaced him with or if you kept him to be that deceiver how you would have changed him physically to be i guess more intimidating um but maybe i don't know contacts could have done something because he definitely does have those very gentle eyes <laughs> i mean yeah i could call some favorites in and got vin diesel in <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> I mean, she's so fast and furious. Why not? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Look, if that had happened, Wonder Woman's third act would have been worse than Bloodshot. We all remember how bad that movie <laughs> was last year. So leave, just just leave oh, in to I Am Groot and, and the Fast and Furious movies. Like, if I wasn't... Watching that movie, the review for Victims, when I did, I would have walked out of that theater. <laughs> <laughs> that movie was so bad. Anyway. Oh yeah, it, it was pretty bad. You guys uh, can hear it uh, right now on our Patreon. Um, it's patreon.com forward slash victims and villains. Um, but uh, also, uh, you know, I guess now that we have the the negative out of the way. All right. You feel better now, Josh? Um, I do. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, Brandon, I'm going to do an aside real quick. What were the other things you wanted to talk about before we kind of get into some of, like, the heavier, like, stuff? Yeah, so uh, with Aries, like, the the twist, it made you think it was uh, Ludendorff for the whole time and then it twisted around to not be. Was that something that y'all saw coming or was that something that was a shock to y'all, like everybody else? Um. Well, having known wonder woman there was part of me that was like uh i don't i it could be but i don't think it is but if it's not i don't know who it is 
If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you were someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth, so please stay with us. Yeah, so the internet exists. Oh, well, the internet ruins everything. Uh, and I, like, back when I was, like, still, like, following, like, the news of everything, <laughs> yeah. like, it was leaked that, like, Thwaites was playing him, and I was like, this guy? And I, I remember, like, actually, like, Erica came home from work, and I was like, I'm so pissed right now. <laughs> She's like, what? I was like, apparently there's a leaked thing that says, like, uh, Professor Lupin's going to be Aries. And I was like, I just don't see it. Like, like you were saying, like, he's a proper British gentleman. <laughs> it's like the idea of, like, Michael Caine playing an older version of Aries. Like, it, no. Um, oh, how cute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think right now, like, for... It, the way that the movie like plays out like you really do believe it's like Ludendorff because yeah. like they have they're really good at giving those like red herrings to when you're like expecting them especially with the super soldier gas yeah and the just the some of the fight sequences that he's in and like how enthralled he is with the uh process of like making the war and like controlling the war with Dr. Poison who we can talk about in just a few minutes uh but yeah i was really disappointed when when the big twist <laughs> came i was like man because daniel houston is a, a fantastic actor and oh yeah he did that part very yeah. well for sure see now the thing with with that super soldier gas that's what what got me though because if you are the god of war you wouldn't need that but if you're trying to blend in i mean yes but that's the part that I that had me thinking, okay, I don't think you could be, but I still don't know who who should be then. <laughs> that's what got me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I guess when we're talking about like the, the villains in this, um, we can also address Dr. Poison, who... Yes. Uh, Dr. Poison, so Wonder Woman made her debut in Sensation Comics number one. Dr. Poison, at least in this version... Uh, makes her debut in Sensation Comics number two. She is also a princess, which uh, I think the movie kind of like deviates from. But uh, I, I think that she was the perfect kind of villain to have as a secondary villain. And yeah. I, but I would also argue that it feels more like she's like the main antagonist because we spend so much time with her that by the time you get to the third act, like you're expecting Ares because he's been teased throughout the entire film. Yeah. But like, it definitely feels like, uh, perfect. Um, Dr. Poison has a bigger hand in it than I guess she really does. What throughout the film? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted more of her, especially in that third act. Because, like, I, I left that movie enjoying her more than I did Aries. 
And I just feel like they could have done so much more with her if they really wanted to. And I wish they would have, because, like, that's, like, the villain that I take away the most from that movie. Or for for me, anyway. Yeah, I actually, I definitely agree with that, too. Because, you know, I mean, obviously, Ares was the one who influenced her to do everything anyway. But, um, yeah, she's, she, I feel like is left being way more mysterious with who she is and why she's doing what she's doing and and everything and I definitely wanted more from her as well. Yeah, she it seems kind of like a missed opportunity in, yeah. in terms of that. Especially like when you look at like how other franchises have approached their villains. They never want to go after like the main bad guy first. Like they always want to introduce a lesser known villain yeah. and then you can build upon that. Like Batman Begins is a perfect example. Like not a whole lot of people knew who Ra's al Ghul was prior to yeah. his introduction in that film. And the League of Assassins, like no one knew about those as well. And, you know, Dr. Poison like was a, for as big of a Wonder Woman fan as I am, like I've never come across any of her in modern day comics. Um, no, <laughs> no, you're not going to. <laughs> but they actually reinvented her character in, uh, well, they did a second version of Dr. Poison in 1999. She made her debut in Wonder Woman number 151. Um, and she was like a descendant of the original Dr. Poison. But again, like not a whole lot of people know. I think when you're talking about like Wonder Woman's like uh, gallery of villains, you're you're thinking about Doctor Psycho, Ares, Cheetah, oh yeah, Max Power, like the the big juggernauts. You know, not the like World War Two villain from the early forties. World War One. I thought she looked cooler in Ares too. Yeah, well, to <laughs> to to your point, uh, Kate, like the the film does take place in World War One, but uh, by the time that she had made her debut, it was World War Two, I believe. Okay, that's that's in like terms of like context. Like that's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here's an interesting fact for you guys. Um, while we're talking about the subject of comics, uh, the God Killer Sword, and listeners, you guys can please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, did not actually originate in Wonder Woman mythos. But Deathstroke mythos. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just a fun fact that that I uh, came across it. It was uh, one of his new 52 runs, I believe, if I remember correctly. That's interesting. I don't think... I don't... Honestly, I can't say I know enough about Deathstroke to confirm or deny. Well, yeah. It, it's... Uh, Deathstroke's an interesting character with a <laughs> to say the complex least. To say the history. least. <laughs> um, I have a love-hate relationship with, with Deathstroke. I think everybody does. <laughs> we'll definitely be talking I about don't. it. <laughs> I love Deathstroke. <laughs> we'll definitely be talking about it um, during the um, Snyder Cut episode. But Ronnie and I, your husband, we did a whole episode where we talked about Deathstroke. Oh, he loves talking about Deathstroke. <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Uh, so Wonder Woman's a really great movie to, I think, just about in line with Man of Steel when you're talking about a really compelling mental health journey. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that Wonder Woman inspires and also has a lot to say as far as, like, mental health. Um and I think one of the things that is like very early that kind of caught me off a of guard is the scene where she's training with um I'm gonna mispronounce this name, uh Ant Hope. And I don't know, I can't pronounce Greek very well. Neither can I. I just um, pretend. But she is played <laughs> by uh Robin Wright's Princess Buttercup herself. <laughs> and uh there there's a scene where like she kinda like she's a teen like diana's a teenager and she knocks it out of like the sword out of her hands and uh, the words that she says you know you keep doubting yourself diana you're you're stronger than you believe yeah and that's a really encouraging thing to to hear 
I, I think sometimes when we kind of get in the routine of life or we get find ourselves kind of going through the motions of anxiety or depression or just the busyness really of life that we um, have these like blinders on that kind of like lie about the, the strength and like how much like we can really tolerate. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I really love the, their relationship because uh, throughout the course of the film, like anti hope, I'm just going to call her Auntie. We're just going to call her Buttercup. Uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, Buttercup is like really like pushing Diana to grow and, and be better and like challenging her because she knows that she can do more and be more. And I just, I found that really encouraging throughout the course of this because I know that in my own mental health journey, I've had a lot of people in my corners that have kind of been that voice for me. And it's really championed me to be the man that i am Mm -hmm. today and you know having those people those mental health people in your corner that are going to champion you um and challenge you i think is is really crucial um for growth Mm -hmm. oh yeah i i loved those scenes because you think about um especially that that age is just so tough yeah with figuring out well who am i what am i supposed to do what's my purpose why am i here um and women and men but from a woman's perspective women compare themselves to other women all the time and that's literally what diana grew up with because there was no other option (laughs) it was just other women and that kind of comparison can you can leave you just feeling rejected all the time, which is why she very easily doubted herself and would get in her head because she would see these fierce women, warriors that were um, successful and thriving and wanting to be that so desperately um, can can almost even hinder you from reaching your full potential because you're thinking that your um, your ceiling is their ceiling. When really, like you were saying, Josh, being able to have that iron sharpen iron, that it's actually supposed to be her floor. Yeah. Um, so that she can go and, and lead and do more. Um, but yeah, for sure. And leaving, yeah, just thinking about <laughs> all the anxieties that I went through as a middle school, high school age kid and and feeling rejected that I wasn't good enough. And, and I mean, I also grew up with, with a female predominant family and um, trying to figure out, well, where do I fit into all of this? How can I add to this legacy of, of really awesome women? Um, and that can be overwhelming in itself. So when you don't have someone that's, uh, you know, encouraging you and edifying you and, and being your cheerleader, um, it can be very lonely for sure. So for her to have had someone like that, that genuinely cared for her, that genuinely wanted to see her thrive um, and pushing her to do more, to get out of those comfort zones, to get out of that anxiety is huge. Absolutely huge. So Wonder Woman has a lot of different origin stories. And the one that the film actually ends up going with is that you know she was molded from clay and Mm -hmm. from clay was you know struck by zeus and that's kind of like how she came to be and we're never at least in my knowledge like the how like the amazons like birth and stuff like you know that's never really been explored i don't think um and there's a there's another scene in two particular where she's like a full grown adult and you can kind of see that she still has a lot of those doubts. It's right it's the scene right before Steve crashes mm-hmm. onto Paradise Island and she has this like quiet aside like right after a training exercise and she's just like looking at her hands. It's this like very quiet, very somber moment, but Gail is conveying to the audience is this Diana's thought process of what am I? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I feel like we're always kind of like searching f- for answers to that question of like, what is my like actual like yeah. purpose? 
and Diana never really kind of comes into her purpose until like she steps onto the battlefield for the mm-hmm. first time. And, but just kind of watching her, I think there's a lot of like relatability and a lot that, you know, we can learn and glean from, you know, especially being, uh, you know, just kind of like lost in, in a sea of people, you know, trying to find your, your place among them is, is hard. And, I really appreciate and really value like understanding and, and seeing it from a, a woman's perspective because it it brings a lot more depth to Diana's journey and the throughout the like the first half of the movie. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I love that that very sweet, subtle moment of her looking at her hands too. I that is I mean, you're right. We definitely struggle with that. If you if you don't know who you are and you don't feel confident in who you are, there are definitely those, you know, continuous moments of doubt and, and continuing to fall into that comparison and that rejection that, well, maybe I'm not going to be good enough, you know, as the people around me and maybe I don't have a purpose and, you know, lies like that. I mean, Wonder Woman 2 is not only the only character that we get to explore their their mental health journey through. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about this film is you, you know, this is World War One. This is the war to end all wars. And, you know, you have all of these countries fighting one another. Mm-hmm. And you have this, like, ragtag team of heroes that are rep- so thorough in the representation of diversity and the need for change. And so we get to explore so many different avenues. Um, the chief, I think, is one of the, is a great example of that, where here you have a guy that, you know, has comes from a legacy of, you know, the Native Americans, people stealing their land and, like, how that's affected their their mental health and that to to us i think you know we consider it like history that we never actually consider like how it's influenced an entire race of people Mm -hmm. you know mentally speaking oh yeah that kind of that kind of trauma i mean if it's not dealt with and if if resiliency is not built that just very easily becomes generational to the point where that victim mindset becomes normal and um and it just becomes this vicious ugly cycle um you know you you can even look that in into comparison with diana that they have a thriving mindset that they are these victorious warriors and so when you grow up around that that becomes normal that becomes the expectation but when you know, you've been defeated and, uh, you know, pushed down your whole life and your generations have been defeated and pushed down their whole lives. It can be very easy to just see that as normal. Yeah, environments really have a profound impact. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the things that I've been uh, thinking about a lot recently is kind of like just even how I am as an individual, like why am I the way that I am? Like how much of my parents influence is because like the way that I think now, or as my wife can attest to, like the reason that I'm so like stubborn is because (laughs) of my mom. Like it's a, it's a product of my, my upbringing. And, you know, I love the, the flip side, like you had talked about where you have like Diana is like the Amazons, like that's, thriving Mm -hmm. like you know she has this expectation of you know what people should be and she finds out that it's a lot more complicated than she was led to believe and the scene where you know they're kind of like in the debriefing stage after steve hands them dr uh psychos sorry dr poison's uh notebook you can kind of see like how complicated it is and we, we were talking about this um while we were watching the movie but there is like one scene in particular where uh you know you have uh the the general is basically like you know that's soldiers that's what they do they they yeah. die yeah and you know war i think also degrades like men to just kind of like 
casualties and numbers like anything to have that path of victory and so you're diana's kind of going through this like experience of like the (laughs) the complex nature of of man's like Mm -hmm. theologies and like thought processes and like how we process so much but the what the general says like you know in in particular is one of the more like heartbreaking sequences and it's kind of like maybe not something that's like gonna dawn onto like casual viewers but i think that you know us using this platform to kind of encourage and you know talk about mental health and and educate on it it you know do we do we really see people as kind of nothing more than a, a casualty or a number that is you know fighting for the ends justifying the means yes and that's i mean that's a a mindset in itself that you'll find in those and i I don't want to say all military but like in this in this particular example that that military mindset of okay well they're just pawns and in order for me to win this war i got to move my pawns around um and that's okay that's all I need to do. Um, instead of being able to see them as as life, <laughs> as yeah. actual human beings that have their own families and, um, you know, they had their own lives and jobs outside of this war um, that I would want them to go back to when the war was over. But, you know, again, if you just see them as your pawns in your little chess game, then that's all that they're going to be. I think about, you know, how do we often even, you know, in – everyone that's on this podcast like we've never fought like we don't understand the casualties of war we're not yeah you know trying to undermine it um but you know should just to also generalize that mindset you know how much times how much relationships do we sacrifice to kind of get our our own goals (laughs) and our own determinations of you know stuff and uh you know I remember way back when we were like first doing this podcast, like I wasn't very like need for relational. It's like, how can I improve my numbers? So I'm going to go after guests that are, you know, hitting hundreds of thousands of followers and their thousands of followers are going to become my thousands of followers. And that's a really damaging place to be because you, like you said, like you're, you're belittling people Mm -hmm to numbers and not actually considering life and you know now with you know uh some of the the viewpoints that i i have and some of the things that like i've corrected myself over the years or have been corrected has been the idea of you know really vowing valuing human life um and you know, not taking it for granted and like stopping and, and having those those quiet little moments like we get to see uh, throughout the, the film, like, you know, whether it's it's Charlie singing or it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, Diana and um, Steve, you know, having like the sharing the dance for the first time or, you know, Edna Candy kind of, you know, being introduced in uh fashion shows and whatnot you know you have all these these quiet little moments and you miss out on those when you have those viewpoints yeah see and i love the i love those parts of that movie because i know there's been many comparisons between the dc movies and the marvel movies that you know the marvel movies are so much more lighthearted and the dc movies are so serious and dark and <laughs> which is funny because the comics are the opposite of that yeah (laughs) which is funny that's how it kind of ended up and um and to be able to see the lightheartedness of dc in those moments i think are also very important to to also bring that reality to it i mean obviously there's a lot of heavy serious things in this world but you know uh, like Erica and I were talking earlier, if I'm going to try on new clothes, <laughs> I need to stretch out and move yeah. around to see if they're going to be comfortable when I'm, you know, living my life. Just like Wonder Woman was trying to make sure she could fight in her dress. <laughs> I'm lifting up like these like yeah. uh, freaking bottoms and just like... I know, her pantaloons. <laughs> where, where, will my, where will my sword go? <laughs> yes, and that 
that too is also a great reminder that, you know, not everything is so heavy and so serious, yep. that there is such uh, that sweet hope that's out there. And and life is about kind of like savoring into those like little moments. Mm-hmm. Like There's another little moment in particular that it's like, it's a very like blink and you miss it kind of moment, yeah. but it's like a very tender moment. And it's as they're, going towards the ship and kind of going to collect their ragtag team diana's introduced to ice cream and it's (laughs) it's like such a nerdy moment for like people that like understand the source material but it's like it's this very little just wholesome moment where she just like this is delicious you should be proud of yourself sir (laughs) 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 <laughs> and uh but it, it reminds us to value not only the lives of others but also the importance of our of our own lives and our own mental health and like setting yeah. up those parameters to have those smaller moments yeah yeah and i mean we can even reflect on our own lives where somebody said or did something that was very small to them but was very big to us. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, you could make up this whole scenario that, you know, Diana comes across and gets the ice cream and is just very excited in that moment. She's trying ice cream for the first time. You should be so proud of yourself, sir. Thank you so much for giving that to me. And he could have very easily been in that situation where nobody bought ice cream that whole day except for her. And now he just had his first sale of the day, and that's a huge deal. Oh, my gosh, you're right. I should be proud of myself because I finally made the sale, and I'm so excited. Yes, now I have, you know, this new energy to want to sell more ice cream. I mean, I'm first in line for ice cream all the time, so I would totally be there. But, like, you know, something as small as that could very easily change someone's whole day, outlook, whatever. There's another great line that Shamir says to Diana after the first, like, introduction of like wonder woman and he's talking specifically about charlie and he says everyone is fighting their own battles just as you're fighting your own and you know seeing someone else as a person Mm -hmm. really helps to illustrate that you know we don't understand where we're coming from or where we're meeting that person in the the matter of the day and you know, like you're saying, like you, she could have been the only customer that mm-hmm. day. Like he could have been, you know, on the verge of like bankruptcy or yeah. like something like that. And like that one person saying that, like, really means all the difference. And yeah. to make someone's day, like, it doesn't have to be like this, like overly complicated. Yeah. I'm gonna go into debt <laughs> kind of situation. Yeah. Like yeah. holding the door, like complimenting someone on their shirt or you know shoes or or hair makeup like it makes the difference yes yes and they may not even realize that what they said or did made that kind of impact how would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools conventions and other events well now you can simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as one dollar a month You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression, and you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah, it's those little things like you just never know how how small you have to be to to or how small it has to be to make someone's day like like the ice cream thing and stuff like that like it's just the little things that really matter and I feel like that that gets lost sometimes and like go you know, back to the ice cream scene like it's just it just reminds you of like how how precious things can be no matter if it's a big thing or a small thing you know that's why people lose track of that sometimes.
Yeah. And it's it's also very sweet that it's it's approached in almost like a childlike manner because Diana is experiencing all those things for the first time and she's just kind of looking at the world as as, you know, this brand new adventure. Um and I think as we get older and we experience more traumas and, you know, allow anxieties to continue to rule over our lives we miss out on those sweet sweet opportunities to see the world as as beautiful because there's so much focus on well these people are doing this and that war is starting over here and you know this forest is dying and like all of these terrible things it's always like nice to like have those like reminders of like simpler like wholesome times yeah and I, I mean, I, I feel like I can't speak for you, but I, I definitely can speak for, for Brandon and I. Um, you know, we're recording this on a few days after the launch of Paramount Plus. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, like, me, me and him were, like, have just been talking. A lot of our conversations here recently have been about, like, all the cool, like, Nickelodeon content. Like, we're going to jump back into whether <laughs> yeah. it's Zoe 101 for Brandon or, like, you know, some of the cartoons like As Told by Ginger or like Rocket Power, yeah. or Fanboy and Chum Chum or you know, <laughs> SpongeBob or, you know, Our Real Monsters. And those are part of both of our childhoods that just, you know, remind, like bring us back to like a simpler time. Yeah. And, you know, having those parameters in place to like, you know, hold yourself to a standard where like you can just like remember because like as you're talking about like there is a lot going on in the world like there's a lot of like trauma that Mm -hmm. is like introduced like day in and day out and i do want to talk about it here in a specifically in a second but i I think that it really kind of you know have those reminders like like purposely put them in place that like it doesn't matter like if the world is like melting around you like find joy yeah. find purpose yeah find hope and sometimes it's easier said than done oh yeah but you know even if it's just like watching a, a show that you know you grew up on and um you know we're a couple weeks away from um removed from wandavision wandavision was a great example of that mm-hmm. where you know the reason that <clears throat> wanda in the season of grief that she was in like reenacted and took her family through like all of the shows like you know malcolm in the middle the dick van dyke show was because like that was a reminder for her for like simpler times yeah and it's really important to have those memories and those practices in place to you know really create beneficial mental health for yourself oh yes yeah there are times where um, my husband, Ren, and I, where one of us will recognize that the other one is having their little pity party about whatever, and we will take that moment to stop and say, okay, so what are you thankful for right now? And begrudgingly, the other one will be like, well, ugh, I'm thankful that, you know, the sun's out today. Okay, cool. So what else are you thankful for? And we challenge each other, you know. To continue. Okay, so what else are you thankful for? What else you... And so we'll get into, you know, some of the more serious things. It's like, oh, well, I'm thankful for you and our marriage, and I'm thankful for our son, and I'm thankful for, you know, this house that we live in. But then we eventually start to, you know, realize what we were doing and where we need to get ourselves. And, um, you know, Renny and I will like to get silly with it, too. It's like, well, I really like the way this carpet feels when I roll around on it. It's really nice on my face. (laughs) (laughs) And because then you start, you know, laughing from that and and you're like, okay, you know what? That was terrible, but I don't need to dwell on that. Um, And that helps to build that resiliency that so many people are missing out on. Sure. Um, One of the things that in particular, and I think this will appeal to um, Christian listeners is, you know, Jesus talks about in the Bible where uh, specifically where the disciple he's teaching the disciples how to pray and like the very first thing that he talks about is you know giving god praise obviously but also like being thankful as well yeah and i feel like that is like really like changed like my perspective personally like in my day-to-day is like how to be thankful and like 
how to give thanks for like the smaller moments like yeah the every day is filled with things that like i'm not gonna 100 percent always agree with or like and that's okay because you know we're all different yeah and we all like different things and we all have different passions but the thing that we all have to remember is you know what am i thankful for today yeah and i think we only kind of have this tendency to give thanks once a year yeah while we're all gathered around <laughs> oh family and but, food yeah <laughs> for thanksgiving yeah <laughs> but you know thankfulness is a is something that changes perspective yeah quickly yeah and practically yeah yeah believe it or not there are going to be trials and tribulations yeah it's it's promised it's going to happen <laughs> but what you do with it is what's so important yeah because otherwise you let those traumas rule your life and then you don't get to take the responsibility of a lot of those generational things that have been passed down um, to say no more. I don't, I don't need this. Um, I want a better life for myself. I want a better life for my future generations if I have them or even just encouraging other generations to walk out of things like that as well. Man, y'all mentioned Thanksgiving food and I'm really hungry. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, she I don't have much to add to that. Like, like that that's perfect for what I would follow up with. I mean, you know, like just letting go of things that you were around your whole life can be super tough. But it's like experiencing things for the first time and growing. I mean, I mean, I talked a little bit about it, but like, you know, I grew up in the South, so like me at twenty nine, twenty eight years old now, I'm learning so much different things that I didn't learn then. So. So yeah, like it's it's tough sometimes to adapt to to things around you and different things and experience new things and and uh, it can be tough, but you just be open about it and it, it gets easier along the way. Yeah, agreed. I feel like too that this podcast has kind of made me see film a lot differently. <laughs> like I don't watch like a movie, just like watch it. Like I'm like processing like the, the mental health, like details of every yeah. journey. And, uh, I watched this movie, not, not but a couple months ago for, uh, wonder woman 84. And one of the things that, uh, really struck me this first time is when Diana and the guys are being led through the barracks for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing like all of these like death and, and like destruction and like people that are like mutilated. And like, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see. And I don't want to belittle, you know, the casualties of war because they're very real thing. But, you know, sometimes we, you go through things like Shamir said, like everyone is battling their own battles. And, you know it's really easy to see a cut or a scrape or you know a number of you know different ailments but it's another thing completely to see someone for their mental health mm -hmm. and their own mental health struggles and i think that that's another reason why we have like such a, a stigma and i kind of felt like diana like sometimes like looking around the battlefield and just like feeling like all this like destruction and just like wanting to like put an end to it and kind of like that's how i feel about mental health stigma sometimes is like you know we're looking around and we won't take someone at their word when they're saying that they're they're anxious or that they're scared or they're depressed because like you can't physically see that like you're trusting yeah. someone and taking it on their word and yeah. mental health gets a, a lot of backlash for that and I, i'm curious like you know do we truly like understand like the, the gravity of suicide and depression and some of the things that, you know, go unseen in the world? Mm -hmm. So many things I could say. <laughs> yeah. Those invisible battles are, are challenging because we are fighting our own and then you're trying to navigate how someone else is fighting their own and where, where do I fit? How do I help you? How do you help me? How do, how do we live with this together? And, um, and I think, too, it goes back to that, that comparison that, you know, someone might say that they're feeling anxious because of a certain situation that either I've never had trouble with or I've overcome, and therefore it's harder for me to see that you're being anxious about it. 
and well, I mean, get over it. Like you can just do it. Right. You know, that kind of, you know, response Mm -hmm. (laughs) that people will give. Um, and, and you miss out on, you know, those opportunities to be able to sit and listen and walk with somebody and meet them exactly where they're at. Um, because I mean, I can even think about me and my sisters. We are fairly close in age. We had practically the same life experiences growing up, but the way each of us has internalized and responded to those things are all very different because of, you know, what resiliency we have learned and even just thinking about birth order and um, uh, different abilities that we may or may not have and and things like that um, where you would think, oh, well, they all grew up together. They all should have the same responses to things, and we, we, we don't. Um, and I, I think a lot of that does come back to that comparison of not seeing somebody where they're at because, again, like I said, you either – have never experienced it so you don't know the depth of their emotions on it or you know you've you have overcome that and you're like oh well poo poo on that i've already done that you should too (laughs) yeah that's a that's a really nasty can of worms to kind of get in (laughs) because like it it is it goes to this like ideology that like all mental health struggles are the same yeah and we're not like um so uh the entire movie revol- it's a documentary that revolves around like the correlation between like being bullied and like depression and mm-hmm. like suicide and like how it affects it and the film kind of goes through so many different things but one of the things that the CDC that they give statistics for is since 2006 suicide rates are uh for African American kids are up 71% yeah and LGB tq youths are twice as likely yeah. to be bullied than non-lgbt than their non-lgbt uh, counterparts and that comes from the department of justice and the department of education but as a married you know straight white male i'm never gonna feel mm-hmm. the mental health struggles of racism or homophobia mm-hmm. or or transphobia and i know that all of the battles that are going on within those persons, people are going to be different than my own. And it is about meeting people where they're at and and creating those safe havens and those relationships and talking about the the statistics and, and talking about and being vulnerable. That's why every episode we include the statistics and you guys heard them earlier, but you know, just to kind of, you know, really, emphasize the point that we're trying to make is that you know these battles go unseen and sometimes even unheard yeah um you know there are uh as as of this recording there are 130 suicides that take place daily on american soil there are uh annually and uh, internationally there are 800,000 successful suicides that take place um, and that's one death roughly every 40 seconds. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're thinking about that's just suicide. You know, that's not talking about all the uh, – I think it's – I think the statistic is like 17 million Americans, adults, just adults, are diagnosed with depression. You know, we have like – I think the statistic from Rain is like every – nine minutes a uh child is sexually assaulted mm-hmm. we have uh you know one i think it's like every maybe it's every nine minutes or every 12 minutes i always get those two mixed up but like there are you know tons and tons of like sexual assaults that take place every day mm-hmm. and like our justice system is so incredibly flawed that only five out of every 1000 actually see the inside of a, a prison cell and you know all of these things kind of come from educating and understanding the gravity of you know the mental health and and the invisible wars that you know we choose to kind of evade because like the the stigma and understanding that they're really hard to talk about mm-hmm. oh yeah like 
I, I can't make I can't get the saying right, but I used to hear it all the time when it's all podcast by um, from Jr. His old wrestling commentator. It was why do something for someone tomorrow you can do it today. Yeah, and it's like. You never know what someone's going through. And it's like what Josh said a little bit ago about, you know, he can't relate to homophobia and racism and stuff like that. Be going through that. But it's like, it, it's our job and everyone's job to constantly be, to be nice and to be like, hey, how's it going? You know, like always, you never know what someone's going through. Like me, like I work in a job where I'm always going to different stores, dealing with managers at other stores. And it's like, a lot of times they're rude to me. But I always try to kill them with kindness because you never know what's going on that day or why they're in the mood they're in. And it's just like you just never know. So, like, all, I just I don't know. It's just like you should always be – be uh, just be kind to everyone whenever you can because you never know what, what someone's going through. And you can't see it sometimes because all, 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 our mental health is, is – is different than a like mind's different than others you know what we go through so also too you never realize the impact that that kindness is going to have or you know having a conversation with someone you never really know or understand like how much of that is going to impact um you know i while we're winding down there's a, a one of the my favorite moments from any convention we've ever done is uh we i always like i always like to comment on people's like cosplays because i know Mm -hmm. it's a lot of hard work and i sincerely envy people that are that (laughs) creative well the amount of time and detail yeah (laughs) um but uh wonder uh, a couple years ago there was a convention we did and there was this woman that had done the uh done a cosplay for uh atlanta who is uh, Nicole Kidman's character in Aquaman. And I mean, it was a, just a amazing cosplay. So we, I got drew her over to the table and I was like talking to her and I was like, man, I was like, how many people have just like commented on like how good this looks? Because it, it looks like it just walked off a movie set yeah, and yeah. she's like, you're the first. And I just remember like, her her smile was just like indescribable of like how much it meant to her that like I took time to like have that conversation mm-hmm. and ask about it and every time that she would pass by our table because it's a small convention yeah yeah every time she would pass by our table like she would always like always a big smile always waving yeah and you know you just never know about the impact that you're gonna have yeah by being kind to someone. Yeah, it's it's interesting too because you even think about. I mean, I I have a, a background in in child psychology and youth development and all that fun stuff, and so how your brain is actually rewired from, you know, that negative thinking and, you know, that pessimistic look at uh, outlook and and all that kind of stuff and and being able to do something kind for someone and not expect anything in return and how that physically can change your brain. Yeah. And, you know, release these different um, endorphins and hormones throughout your body that you're like, wow, okay, that actually felt really good. (laughs) And (laughs) because, I mean, realistically, a lot of people have an addiction to anger and bitterness mm. and don't realize that they're in that. And then when something nice happens or something good happens, um, it, I mean, it seriously, it, it rewires the brain where you are almost forced to think a little differently and then those new pathogens are created, and then those old ones die out, and then it just becomes a lot more natural to do yeah. those kind things. Um, so that that kind of practice really, really changes your outlook. I mean, a lot of people will just say that, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it changes your outlook. But, like, it actually changes your outlook. Your brain is actually physically changing when you do things like that. 
yeah i i've shared it before on this the show but um the reason that i got into doing suicide prevention advocacy and mental health work and um is because you know you're talking about the the way that the brain responds to negative you know feedback or bitterness mm-hmm. and uh, a friend of mine like had committed suicide because of that exact thing like mm-hmm. just being around an environment where he was just constantly put down and eventually you start to kind of like believe those like you yeah. you take up root and identity in those things and you know so to also you know be encouraged to like be kind is like you can sincerely take up identity in Mm -hmm. that same exact headspace of you know i am enough i am worthy you know to of this life that i live in like it might not always have like the best of days but i'm gonna choose to constantly be nice to others and uh you know figure out my own place in this this crazy life and this journey and i think that's one of the most beautiful things too about diana's journey is she's trying to find her place and her purpose because she doesn't quite feel like she fits in with the amazons but she also doesn't feel like she fits in with man's world yeah so that's really it's, it's really interesting to kind of see where she is as far as like her journey like wonder woman 84 and Mm -hmm also in bvs because like she doesn't feel like she's kind of reached that point of completion yet yeah yeah she's still very much on that journey of even just figuring out the powers that she's capable of yeah (laughs) because you know you see in wonder woman that she's only just learning everything for the first time and uh you know she doesn't reach that full potential just yet but that uh, and and like you were saying uh, earlier with like her being able to look at her hands like those those moments were starting to rewire her brain to to have that different kind of outlook of okay well actually I might actually have a purpose here in doing things and and then of course being able to meet Steve and and going out on her own independently to be able to discover <laughs> yeah was the the beginning of all of that and i love being able to see her you know progress throughout the whole movie and then you know onward and and whatnot so yeah i'm i'm really curious to see where she ends up with uh like wonder woman 84 or sorry wonder woman 3 that is fast tracked uh after wonder woman 84 but uh i feel like i just want to leave the conversation like right there like i just want to leave like (laughs) listeners saying like you know hey like i just want to remind you of your value and your worth absolutely and um i recently like i went to the the movie theater and uh i got there like super early and they were like playing these like commercials for like local uh like nonprofits. and um this uh this girl kind of like got told that she was ugly and she walked into the bathroom and there was like the on, the on the mirror she was like looking at herself and then she like her eyes gaze up to a left hand it uh yellow spot in the corner of the mirror and it's a sticky note that says you are enough mm-hmm. and uh she takes uh she like looks down at the sink and there's like sticky notes and uh a sharpie down there and she wrote you know you are beautiful and she comes back in the next scene and it, the entire board is like mirrors just filled up with all these positive notes and yeah um so i mean even if you have to write yourself notes like i am enough or i am beautiful like sticky notes and and sharpies (laughs) dollar store oh yeah i did that all throughout college (laughs) there were post notes all throughout my dorm room (laughs) i mean hey it it works um can confirm but uh i i just want to list leave listeners with just the the notion that that you are enough and that you you do have value, and I think that's going to do it for us on this episode. We're one away from the Snyder Cut now. Woo woo, uh, <laughs> Brandon. Where can people find you online? Twitter at Brandon W Miller or Instagram at uh, the Changing at Toms. Would you like to share where people can find you online? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> um. Oh, Lord. Technically, I use social media, but (laughs) will I always respond? Uh, I don't know. But um, 
I am on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, Twitter and Instagram are both, um, I think they're both an Irish frenzy. I hope so. But otherwise, I am Kate Webster on Facebook. <laughs> the one that looks like Brave. <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys can follow my 2021 20, film journey uh, on Letterboxd. It's at Captain Nostalgia. And you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net where you guys can find all of our social media, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitched, and Letterboxd. You got movie reviews, past episodes. Check out our spinoff podcast. Uh, that's high praise. A Nicolas Cage podcast <laughs> and coffee and conversations as well. And most importantly, you guys can also check out our mental health resource library, all of which you guys can find in the descriptions wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for being a part of this. I, I really valued your insight here. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> uh, until next time, we will be back on the next episode talking about the long-awaited, possibly myth four-hour extravaganza that is Zack Snyder's Justice League. We'll catch you guys soon. <laughs>